Hey, Hi. Hector. Great to see you today. Hey, how are you? Very good. Very good. Um, Hector, before we jump into our conversation, maybe if you could just give us a little bit of your story, talk to us a little bit about your journey, you know, the different things that you've gone through that's brought you to this point where we're having this conversation. Sure. So um, I started out uh, in design. Um, sort of the tra traditional graphic design, visual communication design. Um, I'm quite old, um, but you know when I was going to school, there was this new thing called the public internet, <laughs> and uh, very quickly traditional designers and even ad agencies started to create little web development teams and offerings and you know, trying to help their clients, um, you know, build an online presence. Mm -hmm. um, so from its early days, uh, you know, in the 90s is when I really started to uh, uh, go from traditional graphic design to, you know, what they call UX, UI and product design today. Um, I've, I've been in the field for forever since then. Um, I very quickly started in, in sort of the consulting field, working with a lot of financial service institutions uh, and banks. Uh, and so that became a bit of a niche of mine um, where um, you know, I, I would help banks and uh, financial institutions work on online banking systems, bill pay, uh, mobile, eventually mobile banking capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I moved from consultancy to the sort of product side, the client side. Uh, eventually, they um, they didn't want to pay consulting rates anymore, so they hired me over. Uh, and then I was doing a lot of the same stuff, but then in-house, like building design as a practice, um, working on that same technology side, um, but applying sort of appropriate usability uh, and design acumen and design thinking practices to do this in a, in a good way. And I've been doing that ever since. Um, I've worked primarily in the US, I'm from the US, uh, but about four years ago or so, um, my former boss of mine, uh, Mike Dobbins, uh, right. who was head of um, uh, uh, PFP, it's a part of the bank here, uh, and they were doing some reimagination work, rethinking the value that a bank could offer its clientele. Uh, and it was quite intriguing. And so we started talking again. And um, long story short, I'm now in Toronto um, leading uh, CX research and design for RBC Ventures. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting about your story is the, the RBC Ventures piece, right? And what you've been doing over the last few years. And my understanding, and you can help fill this in if there's anything I'm missing, is RBC Ventures has two pieces. So one, there's the direct investment that they make into companies. And then there's another piece where they kind of invest with funds and they try to manage capital that gets uh, invested. And they have a desire to return profits, but as well to find those strategic partnerships that will make sense for the bank. Yeah, no, we, we talk about it as a, a bit of a portfolio of play. Uh, okay. How can we innovate um, in and around uh, banking, uh, and we do that through a couple of ways you described. So investing in some companies, taking a commercial stake in the organizations. Um, acquisitions is a, is a part of what we do as well. We've made a mm -hmm. couple of acquisitions that enable us to uh, to move beyond banking as we, we describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also do partnerships. We find mm -hmm. like-minded companies that are similarly trying to innovate and mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, to innovative companies coming together can do something that you couldn't have done, you know, on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have sort of um, organic venture ideation and growth, sort of our version of like, you know, you come up with an idea, we call folks Imagineers um, to come up with an idea, you pitch that idea in our sort of, uh, you know, Dragon's Den-like environment or Shark Tent-like scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and love that idea, we'll invest in it. And that could be people, that could be dollars, marketing dollars. It could be helping you go from an idea to an MVP product to now a scaled business on its own. Mm -hmm. And so 
when we say RBC Ventures and the innovation that we're doing here, it can be any of that. Partnerships, acquisitions, investments, uh, or net new organic growth. Right. So thinking about all those pieces, right? Thinking about the partnerships, thinking about the investments, think about the organic growth that's happening at the bank. You know, where I'd like to start our conversation is just thinking about, you know, how can design help a bank, right? As you're starting to do those different things. Yeah, hundred percent. So um, I was very clear when I talked to Mike that a big part of, to do my job right, we needed to invest in people who could um, do what I describe as CX research and design. Mm -hmm. um, and so think of when, when, we, when I first started the group, I, I hired a couple of ethnographers, a couple mm -hmm. of folks with degrees in anthropology, um, folks who could understand the human condition, um, who could talk very specifically about individuals that we were trying to target and serve, mm -hmm. uh, be it students or retirees or entrepreneurs. Um, we, it was critical for me that um, to, to do good design, I had to know the people we were trying to design something for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything is rooted in understanding the human condition. And we start with um, quite qualitative type insights, you know, the IDIs, the um, diary studies, um, you know, things like that, to then quantitative uh, type of research and findings to make sure that the insights we're gathering are something that's, um, you know, viable um, and, and can be extrapolated to large swaths of segments. Um, and, and that's sort of the starting point. So design for me is always about solving for the needs of a user, mm -hmm. um, connecting with someone with value that someone else isn't providing. And you got to know people in order mm -hmm. to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sure, we've been at the core of a lot of the innovation we're doing here with that sort of customer first standpoint. Right. And then beyond that, you know, um, you then think about, well, great, I know this individual, I know what their needs are, I can see their pain points. Well, then does the designers, the design thinking methods help you to identify new interesting ways to solve for those pain points mm -hmm. uh, or those missing needs? Uh, and so, yeah, design is at the core of what we do things here for sure. There's a couple of things that are real opportunities for us. So one is in terms of just engagement and loyalty, right? A deeper understanding of the user helps us to truly engage them and create a more loyal base of users. So that's one, right? The second thing is in terms of if we have a deep understanding of the user, there may be new opportunities, right? So an opportunity to expand our market reach in a way that isn't being considered before that we can try and tackle. So that's the second thing. And then a third thing is that if we actually know where, we, if we have a, a good understanding, we can potentially avoid some missteps. So as we're starting to think about what we're gonna develop, what we're gonna create, we're not gonna throw things, we're not gonna start to build things that aren't gonna land as well as they could. I think all three of those are quite valid. Um, I've described us um, as a, a risk mitigator to bad ideas, to percent bad ideas. <laughs> um, I've, I've built a lot of stuff that I thought was going to change the world. Yeah. And I thought it was the best thing, you know, since sliced bread kind of thing. But um, j I'm not necessarily the user, mm -hmm. uh, nor do I represent the needs of a, a big segment of users necessarily. And so mm -hmm. uh, what we've tried to do was uh, mitigate the risk of, um, you know, someone in that ivory tower, uh, you know, some senior executive pursuing something because they feel connected to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you talk to the actual users, if you um, can have sort of um, um, different tactics to have a more empathetic view into their daily lives, well, then you're going to mitigate the risk of building something that doesn't solve their needs. And so, um, we do that um, quite a bit for sure. Um, you know, the other part of, I think, that I would throw out there on what you were describing is um, once you you can see users engaging with you, um, you know, you may have set out to do X, Y, and Z. Well, you mm -hmm. find in reality that users value A, B, 
CND. And so they can help inform the, the things that resonate the most with your product. They can help you to simplify and only focus on those things that they value the most. They can help you adjust your messaging and the call to actions that you put in marketing based upon what they're valuing. And so uh, I think the, um, yeah, um, that sort of insight helps you to pursue better ideas. It helps you to refine those ideas. It helps you to know how to message them in order to connect with more people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And are there things that you specifically try to either build into projects or make sure are happening that are really important to, to play that role that you talked about, that risk mitigator? Yeah, so we start uh, our CX team. So I have um, this, what we call a center of excellence that are researchers and strategists. And it could be anything from, um, you know, a product expansion. We mm -hmm. want to, you know, add a few more widgets um, to our suite of services that we offer. Well, which ones of those should you pursue? Where, where does it make sense for you to extend your product? Well, we bring in researchers to help us uh, evaluate those things, test them with users. Um, it's much easier, cheaper, um, faster to um, get insights through research with no code products. Uh, and not that it'll solve for everything, not that you'll learn every single thing, but you'll get some good insights that can mm -hmm. help inform you before you further invest. Uh, yeah, I mean, we anything that we pursue, uh, I've tried to um, um, lean in and offer our, our researchers as uh, a team to tap into before mm -hmm. we start anything, if that makes sense. It does. So it's offering up the team so that they can lean in early. So that sounds like one piece, right? So making yeah. as much as possible trying to lean in early. The other thing that you you brought up, which I, I think is another piece of it is just the no code. You talked about the no code piece. So before you spend a bunch of development dollars, being clear in terms of what's the target looking like, what are the key features here that we're gonna actually try and build so we're not pursuing things that maybe are techni technically complex, but not useful. Exactly, exactly. You have a premise you have a hypothesis where well, we can test those that premise that hypothesis without having to invest a ton in on the technology side and so let's let's do that let's be smart about um gauging the viability of certain ideas yeah um, you know feasibility is one exercise that i think most companies do right you want to see can i technically build this or is there an acquisition or a plugin that i can use but the viability is sort of the same type of exercise you can do mm -hmm. before investing too much on the code. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're always trying to, um, I mean, again, I have that graphic design background. I've yeah. been in product design for really since it's in infancy. Um, you always want to apply um, high design um, uh, acumen and skills to anything you produce. That can always be an inhibitor to testing out a hypothesis or premise. So bring in really talented people, um, make things beautiful, make them really simple, um, but, but do it in a way where your methods allow you to invest thoughtfully before you uh, mm -hmm. go too mm -hmm. far down a single path. Another piece that there's a, that I found I've been in, in conversations around recently is just around measuring success. So mm -hmm. you've got the idea that we've got this hypothesis. We want to know if it's going to be successful. We want to know if it's going to move the needle, right? So you hear that phrase quite a bit. And now how can we start to measure and get some sort of understanding before launching? So, so I don't know if there's anything that you can share in terms of things that you've seen that have worked well, things that maybe you've seen that you don't do, because I think that that is a, a conversation that people are having around how do we measure, how do we evaluate when it's not in market to help us understand. Yeah, when I, I would say it's not just before launch. You know, we really do try to think of that's just the way in which you build it. You're constantly mm -hmm. testing and learning and mm -hmm. As I, as I launch something in production, what are the mechanisms by which I'm going to get mm -hmm. that insight and feedback, whether it's um, you know, through GA or some other plugin where I get to see mm -hmm. heat maps um, um, on how the user is uh, behaving within an app. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's short of the way in which you have to build things these days. Um, uh, enable you to constantly learn and test. Uh, because the, the nice thing about what we're doing is that they're living, breathing organisms, right? We're building digital businesses that never have a an end, right? They're, they're constantly evolving and changing. And so you need those mechanisms by which you're getting that insight mm -hmm. um, and refining based on that, that constant um, test and learn um, a cycle that is sort of at its core of agile and design thinking practices, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we do it everywhere. You, you mm -hmm. test a product before you launch. Um, when you launch, you ensure that the mechanisms by which I can do A, B or multivariate testing are built right in. Um, and the insights you get, whether it's the health and hygiene of the product, right? Is it, is it safe and secure? Is it up? Is it responsive? Well, those same methods could, should be applied to the utility of it, right? Mm -hmm. Am I efficiently moving through this side effectively? Are there any... Um, dropout points and how do I uh, fix those areas? Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we're, it's it's just how you build things these days. Mm -hmm. So coming as a person with design background, design training, right now thinking about all this, the test and learn, is that something that you've leveled up yourself so that you're very comfortable to to do those different pieces? Or is it something where you are hiring specific people with specific skill sets that can elevate your game, right? In terms of that testing and learning. Well, yeah, I, I try to um, do a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, my success has been more on the latter. So mm -hmm. bring in the talent um, that can do this. I'm, I'm smart enough to know that there may be a gap or that there's a better way to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. and open enough to learn that, hey, there's um, a, a, a new method, um, a new software. I, I, think, I think if you've been in design, you know, you, you have to be open to change um, both around tool sets you're using as well as methods you're applying, right? Because there's always this constant refinement and, and ways to get better. Um, and I'm personally always open to that to improve my own personal knowledge in certain areas, but um, I'm also very much aware that uh, I can't do it. Um, I need strong people around me that, that know this and are experts in their field. And so um, hiring talent, um, surrounding you with people who are better than you, I think is mm -hmm. um, critical. So great. And, and as a design leader, what are some of those things that you've brought into the team that you think has really helped in terms of being able to elevate the organization and the test and learn agile development types of approaches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, one thing we've done a lot um, is around design operations lately. So okay. I think around the mechanism by which um, a creative team producing marketing material, you know, can efficiently produce um, a high quantity of digital and out of home and traditional media as well, right? The traffic management to effectively allocate resources, track progress, make sure things are launched on time and, and get it out the door. The means by which we do that from intake to creative brief to, you know, a postmortem at the end, separate from the operations required to um, build a robust product design mm -hmm. practice. Um, right, they're very different, but you need um, efficient operations in both areas, mm -hmm. uh, and even on CX research. Right? What are the methods by which, and how do we track our progress on a given project or anything? So we've invested a lot on our operation side to uh, make sure we're well run. Um, mm -hmm. We're also investing a lot in people experience type of uh, activities. So um, the individual career development programs. Um, the things that I can do today um, to help these individuals five, 10 years from now. Um, mm -hmm. The emphasis I have for myself and the leadership team is that if we built an organization that is putting our people first, that is mm -hmm. helping them through today, we're, we're getting the benefit of, of, of talented people learning and growing, uh, but we're also 
um, doing what's right for the individual and building an organization that mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, five plus years from now, I'll look back on my time there and say that was instrumental to my personal development success. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a way in which we think we'll get alumni back as well. Um, and so when you're a big organization, you know, people do leave. There's a good number of people that cycle back through your organization because mm -hmm. they realize the value that uh, you have. And so it's, it's advantageous for us to invest in our people for a number of reasons. Make things work better, faster, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, help enrich these individuals for their own careers to do better work here, to do better work for them across mm -hmm. their career. So there's a couple things there, right? So there's the first piece that you talked about, which is efficient, right? So on the operation side, on the product design side, so that you can do more of these cycles and it can be done so ideally faster, but as well with uh, as much effort, right? To go through each of those cycles, which then allows more learning to take place because you're going so quickly through. So that's clear. And then the other piece is the skill sets that you talked about in terms of so there's skills that maybe people have today and you need to expand that so that they can do more or that they can deliver a bit more of what's necessary so that you can go through. Um, so in my mind, you know, I consciously think of, you know, the analytics piece, right? And the statistics piece. So someone who maybe doesn't grow up with that type of background and experience. And now you're talking to them about, uh, uh, you know, bay, what, you know, multivariate testing, A-B testing, things like that. They're like scratching their head. And these things can be very complicated, but they can also be very simple, right? If you want to start somewhere and then just move things forward. Yeah, for sure. And, and here, when you're at RBC or in RBC Ventures, um, you know, we've had ethnographers that mm -hmm. went on to be a founder of a their own venture. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people um, on, you know, in one part of our organization, in ventures, hired on, never worked in banking, that mm -hmm. have now moved into the core bank, leading some mm -hmm. strategic initiative there. So I think it's both um, thinking about the skill sets you need to be successful in this new world mm -hmm. that we're in, um, in design, but mm -hmm. there's also, well, what do you as an individual want to do with your career, um, right? Do you want to expand and move from design to marketing, um, mm -hmm. go for or, or go into entrepreneurship. Like we, we can offer a number of paths for individuals, but mm -hmm. you know, what we're trying to do is um, have those conversations with the individual, mm -hmm. make sure they know what the expectations here are, help them improve along the way, um, but also help them move their, their career in any direction that they want, whether it's mm -hmm. deeper in design or may, mm -hmm. maybe it's broader, maybe it's going in another area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if, you, if you're top talent, um, then, you know, we want that talent to stay here and we'll mm -hmm. work with them any path that they're on. So. Cool. Very cool. Okay. So is there anything else that you wanted to add just as we were talking about this first topic, just the value of design? Is there anything else that, you know, that's on your mind that you think would be relevant to share here? And I think a leadership buy-in is critical. Um, you know, I've been, or I've always have been the voice for the design way, mm -hmm. right? Design thinking is a, is a term that's now uh, in vogue, right? It wasn't always, um, you know, you'd scratch your head and you'd often be regulated to an order ticket. Well, that person makes things pretty great, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> for sure, right? And that, that's it. It's just the person who does the production work before it goes to press. Uh, yeah. or whatever the equivalent would be on the, the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what, what we, what I found most successful is when um, you have leadership that do value what you deliver and they recognize that good design doesn't start and stop with a great color palette. They recognize that we're talking about building products that actually work for people. Um, uh, and, so, and so that's been critical. Um, you know, it makes my job easier, it means I have a seat at the table, it means I can bring in folks that you might not normally think would be part of a, um, a design team. Um, and um, it, it, uh, it, it certainly makes things easier. 
And that's something that, I, you know, you hear lots of people talking about in terms of, you know, and, and the way that I've heard is in terms of just, you know, being part of the conversations, having a seat at the table, being more strategic or being or having an opportunity to be involved in more of the strategic conversation. And I think that that is something that, you know, organizations are different places in terms of, you know, where that's happening and how it's happening. So it's, it's great to hear about your experience. And I guess I would ask you, do you have any tips for people who aren't where you are in terms yeah. of, you know, having that leadership buy-in, thinking about what they want for the future and how they might get there? Do you have any tips? Well, I mean, it's, that seat of a table just won't come. You have to earn it. Um, and oftentimes earning it could mean speaking in the language of that organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're a, a for-profit organization. How <laughs> does the things that we're doing here help yeah. those business outcomes that we're looking for? Yeah. Uh, how does the, the work that I do to getting to, to get a better understanding of a particular segment, students, retirees, entrepreneurs, newcomers to Canada, how does that insight help you better understand how to craft products, mm -hmm. um, marketing messages to connect more with that segment? Um, it's never earned. You have to learn how to speak the language of the organization. Um, and you do need to find those advocates. Um, you know, know that you're not alone on this, that when you do find someone that truly values what there are, lean into that. There's a good amount of calories you can waste on it, but then at some point it no longer becomes beneficial to you. You may be in an organization. I have been in the past where mm -hmm. okay, I'm just not going to going to penetrate. And um, even though I've shown the value, even though I think it's there, um, maybe my the, the value that they see in this is still not there. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, maybe that organization isn't for me. And mm -hmm. at some point you have to make those those mm -hmm. judgments on your own. Uh, so another area we wanted to talk to you about, Hector, was just the idea of uh, kind of open banking, ex you know, things that are out there that may have an opportunity to accelerate change, mm -hmm. and as well as any thoughts you have on barriers to change. And because you have experience in Canada and in the United States, we'd love to also get your thoughts, you know, from those different geographies in terms of, you know, where things might go for the future. Okay, so to kick things off, just like as you start to think about accelerators of change in financial services, maybe go a little bit broader in financial services, like what are the things that you're really excited about? You're like, oh, whew, big accelerator, whew, big accelerator, whew, big accelerator. At Ventures, you said, um, well, every bank can offer a mortgage um, or a line of credit to improve your home, right? Because you're doing some renovations, just as an example. Um, every bank does that and they, the product construct is roughly the same. Um, the, um, incentives that they put on it are roughly the same. Um, the way it's marketed is, is roughly the same and they're all targeting that same person. Um, and you know, what, what's different about what we're doing? Well, we're saying, um, yes, people need a mortgage but they also needed help finding that initial home. And even before they were looking for a home, they were a renter uh, coming out of school, wanting to um, you know, find a great home for their neighborhood, maybe start a family. Um, what we've done in, in ventures is try to say that the end is not that line of credit or checking account um, or savings account. Um, the, these are people having lived experiences and how can we support you across that journey? Um, because the more a mortgage is a mortgage. Um, but if I'm there adding value at that moment that we, we think you're ready to start buying or looking because your house, your, your home is, your family's growing. Um, if I can help you move into that home, renovate that home later, find a, a, a contractor that you can trust, just as an example, um, give you discounts when you move in. Right? There's a whole suite of things we can help you as a renter to first time home buyer to next time home buyer. 
And the accelerator for us has been looking at you more broadly than the product, mm-hmm. not just the credit card holder. Um, mm-hmm. Right? It's it's the in, it's the family uh, member. It's the student going to the university. It's mm-hmm. the person going into their second degree or retiring, mm-hmm. wanting to make sure they have enough uh, savings, that kind of stuff. And uh, for us, it's been that broader look that enabled the aperture to broaden and the innovation to broaden as a result. So, mm-hmm. so I think for us, that's been our, our accelerant and, and what's kept it quite interesting as well. Um, in financial services, um, yeah, I think, I think most banks, like when you think of open banking, like when you think of um, the capabilities that fintechs are providing, that the things we offer are commoditized, mm-hmm. uh, that you can get it anywhere. And so I, I think um, what, you know, maybe open banking is an example of is, is sort of lacking, letting go of those areas that you thought you had to wall off, that you had to protect because it was IP. Well, no, that's not where you differentiate. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be around that total value that you deliver. And my hope mm-hmm. is Capital One was a good example. They were enabling a lot of their um, internal capabilities open source. They were, they were giving it out, sharing it, making it available to others to innovate. And that sort of broke, um, you know, sort of the model. I, I did not have to have a patent for every single thing I did and keep it walled off from, um, you know, the world uh, because, you know, the, the differences are on the margins. That's sure. really not where you're going to make a difference. It's going to be that broader set of value and that broader view of the consumer. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think that's what banks have to do. They have to be more open. Um, uh, that's what we said we've had to do, for sure. Yeah, what has started that? To banks to be able to do that, to look broader, to start to, to go out, is it because they were feeling pressure or is there more data that's just available that they can do things that they couldn't do before? I think it's the marginalized nature of the products that they're selling, right? That, mm. that it's, it's um, the, my value is, is um, shrinking. Um, for in Canada, it's a little different than the U S I mean, mm-hmm. have with an RBC or any of the other big banks, you have such market share that mm-hmm. to continue at your same growth, um, you have to try something else. There's only so much you can do from acquiring your competitors customer. Right. Um, why a lot of banks are thinking about broadening, um, or focusing on newcomers or other segment students, that kind of stuff. Cause they're, it's, it's a relatively small market and the growth pockets are small. Um, and so you think about a marginalized product set, business, um, you know, stealing market share from others is really hard. Um, and if you just further marginalize the, the returns on any of those products. And so, um, try, you know, our thought was let's not simply compete there. Let's think broader around what we can do um, expand it so that we're not just a great bank service provider, we're a great yeah. service provider. Um, yeah. I think yeah. that's been a little bit of the, the thought. Yeah. And recognition that for a company that's 150 years old, that to be around another 150 years, you're going to have to change and evolve and adjust. Mm-hmm. 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 Bank started this a while ago going digital, right? Because, yeah. you know, you were a relationship that had to have a handshake, had to walk into branch. Well, no, you felt like I could um, remove some of that um, OPEX through digital capabilities, right? Making it more um, um, digital. Consumers are already there on their desktops and mobile phones. This is sort of the next evolution of that. It's not simply digitizing what you have. It's thinking about the broader value you can deliver. Yeah. And the broader value they can deliver in the experience people are having, right? So... You know, you talked to one of your examples was just around mortgage, right? Mortgages, you know, there's a reason why you're getting a mortgage and there's a bunch of things that are happening around it. And as much as you can understand those reasons, then those are also opportunities. And, and in, I guess the, the thing for me is just what I've seen is this, that now it seems like people have access to more of that. So some of it is that people are giving away that information, right? You look at their Twitter feeds, look at Instagram, you kind of, you know, people are more willing to just share, right? Share with people if it can lead in a convenience to them. 
a convenience that can save them time, energy, money, all of these things, right? They're, yeah. they're happy for. So I think maybe there's a piece of it, which is the market, and there's a piece of it in terms of just individuals, right? Users and what they want now going forward. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think the advantage that a bank would have is that you have a history with this customer of um, providing safety, security, mm -hmm. um, quality service, right? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a relationship that's built on trust that you've earned through, um, you know, protecting uh, the individual. Well, how do you lean into that to make sure that um, as things become more open, that you're equally applying that same level of control and support for the individual, right? Um, and so there's a there's a way in which you can play in this space, but still lean into the the things that make you uh, valued. Thanks. Um, so Hector, I think that's a nice place for us to to end things in terms of you know just the thought of leaning in into new spaces and how large organizations can think through that, how they can work you know, using some of these tools that we talked about design and design thinking to help them to explore those opportunities for the future. So, you know, I just want to say thank you, Hector, so much. Appreciate you, you know, spending some time with us, talking about your experiences and your thoughts just related to, you know, the value of design, innovation, and where there are opportunities. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Okay. It's always Cheers. fun talking.